Well, thank you very much for coming. My name is Steve Thompson. I am Vice President of Supply Chain Innovation for Cardinal Health. Um, just a quick uh, note on me. Uh, I began my career in automotive. I spent 22 years um, building cars. So I am a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Um, a lot of what we're going to be talking today about is really that compare and contrast between what we do in healthcare versus what folks do in industry. And, and I apologize in advance if it hurt anybody's feelings, but we have a long way to go. Uh, a bit about Cardinal Health. Cardinal Health was recognized uh, last year for the fourth year in a row as being number one in innovation uh, by Gartner. Now you think of Cardinal Health as primarily being a, a drug and, and uh, product distributor, and we are actually a lot more than that. We have made significant investment in the last few years um, in innovation platforms, a lot of them relative to inventory management. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today rel relates to inventory management and things getting things from your manufacturers, device manufacturers, commodity manufacturers, all the way to the point of use to the point of care. And to me, the point of care is the nurse. Uh, the nurse is the proxy for the patient. And that's a lot of what I focus on. So let's talk about what's going on in the landscape. In 1965, the Johnson administration enacted Medicare. And at that time, there were 7.2 people working for every person retired. Life expectancy was 71. Let's talk about today. Today, there are 3.2 people working for every person retired. Life expectancy is 79, and there are currently 10 million Americans over the age of 80. Now, if we leap forward to 2022, that's, that's when the um, the numbers folks will tell us that the money runs out from CMS. So, spoiler alert, there is no account in Washington with your name on it for your medical benefits when you retire. It's not like a 401k. In fact, that money all went into general coffers and it's been long since spent. But in 2022, life expectancy is targeted to be around 82 years old. There'll be 2.3 people for, work, for uh, working for every person retired. And that 10 million Americans will become 20. 20 million Americans over the age of 80. In fact, by 2030, we will be super-aged, which means that 20% of our entire population will be over the age of 65. So, if you're like me, you read a lot. This has become a hot potato politically. I think it's not a political problem. This is a very simple mathematical problem. In fact, it's a Ponzi scheme. Here's the next interesting piece. 90% of your total lifetime healthcare spend occurs in your first and your last year of life. In fact, the average annual spend for folks over the age of 65 and under the age of one is nine times greater than the average of folks in between those ages. So here's the next interesting piece. You're reading and hearing a lot about um, health insurance as it relates to private insurance. And yet, we know that 60% of all healthcare spend is CMS. So it's folks who are not even in the private health care and private health insurance realm. CMS is growing year over year. If you are the CFO of a healthcare company, of a hospital, and you're looking at your balance sheet, typically the number one item on your balance sheet is labor. And I don't believe that anyone has an appetite to take nurses out of the healthcare system any more than we already have. So what's the next biggest bucket? It's us. It's stuff and the management movement of stuff. In fact, we're 35% typically of a CFO's budget. We're becoming more and more important. In fact, we also know that in the medical device and implantable supply chain, there is anywhere from 10 to 30% waste every single year. This is the waste due to expired products, obsolescence, lost products. This doesn't even include the money spent on folks at the hospital who are doing counting, looking for, finding, handling. The number's somewhere around $5 billion. What could we do in healthcare with $5 billion found dollars? So, change is happening fast. A particularly graphic view that I like is change is like a freight train, and it's on the tracks. And at some point, you've got to decide when the train arrives, are you going to be in the train 
or on the tracks, right? And it's a little graphic, right? Let me, let me, let me give you it a different way. In January of 2013, a 180 year old company, the finest film manufacturing company in the world, bar none, went bankrupt. And in fact, on the day they filed for bankruptcy, they were still making the finest phot photographic film in the world. Who was that? Kodak. What killed Kodak? The digital camera. Now you'd think they would have seen that coming, right? Who invented the digital camera? Kodak. So how is it that they were unable to reframe how they looked at the world and they were actually killed by their own product? So, change is tough. For everybody but us, I wonder. This idea really kind of hurts me. Um, we are the last industry in the world that still uses the PAR system. How many folks are from our providers on the provider side? Okay. How many folks are still doing PAR? Come on, you're, you, there we go. What does, PAR, what does PAR stand for? Periodic Automated Replenishment. We're going to talk a little bit about this more when we go on. Here's an ask. Stop doing it. It makes no sense. It creates a whole lot of problems. The last industry that did this before us was the, was the grocery store business. Grocery stores. How could grocery stores be light years ahead of, ahead of healthcare? It's ridiculous, but think about it. When you go to the grocery store and you buy a can of peas, when you check out, there's a barcode. What is that barcode called? It's a UPC code, correct. So that UPC code grabs a lot of rich information. It tells the, it tells the provider, the manufacturer, or the salesperson rather, tells the grocery store what you bought, how often you bought it. So now they're getting demand data. They understand any kind of change and variation in that demand. And in fact, you probably get coupons at home based on your buying patterns. They, get, they do a lot of information, a lot with that, inf with that information. Here's what's even more important. Everybody in the entire supply chain can read the UPC code. So I spend a lot of time in hospitals. I spend a lot of time on hospital receiving docs. I see hospitals receiving truckloads of goods and over labeling them because they can't read the barcode. That is ridiculous. So my second ask is let's at least agree to a single barcode standard. Every other industry has done it, regardless of competition. We sometimes don't do things because we think it'll give, give access to the competition. The reality is it makes, makes everybody better. Can you imagine if Kroger had to overwrite that UPC code and overlabel it? So, um, I really enjoy this presentation, primarily because it gives me a chance to opine. So, these are my opinions. Uh, I'd love to debate them with you. Uh, this is my, how I view what we do in healthcare versus what industry does. So, the first is slow. Here we go. If you're like me, sometimes you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, there's a TV on somewhere in the house, and you hear these words. If you call right now, you get a second one absolutely free. Just pay for shipping and handling, right? And when that thing comes in a couple weeks later, uh, you've paid $27 for something that should have cost $9.95. So, A, I should be turning off the TV, but more importantly, what's happening is folks it, are profitizing shipping. If I was your manufacturer and you were allowing me to send things to you prepaid, I'm going to margin the freight. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell you the each at a fantastic price so that I beat the competition, but I'm going to margin the freight. And you're probably not even going to be aware of it. But there's another side to this. See, I spend a lot of time in your hospitals, right? So sometimes I will walk by a box in your OR core that has a sticker on it that says um, overnight shipping. Somebody paid a lot of money to ship it. Probably you. 
and yet that box was received three weeks ago and it still hasn't been opened. See, the other part of freight is that we often don't see it because freight resides on someone else's budget. And so from a hospital perspective, you absorb both the cost of the goods plus the cost of the freight. But the person making the decisions as to whether or not to buy something, oh gosh, we're down to two, I better order one and I better have it here shipped tomorrow, overnight, even though we use one a week, doesn't understand the value and the expense. The second piece of this is how many folks are shipping at the same time. Now this may sound like a plug for distribution, partly because it kind of is, but I don't care if you're using Owens and Minor or Medline or Cardinal Health. All right, I do. I want you to be using Cardinal Health, but that's not important. Part of the issue is you're, by using a consolidator, you're allowing um, freight to be essentially consolidated. Think about this. Uh, we know from Haida what the cost of each um, of each check that you write is. I don't even know it sounded right. So, the entire cost that you absorb for paying for an item, what do you think that is? Take a wild guess. $90, a little high, right? So, it's actually somewhere around $68. So, $68 to process every one of those receivables. That's, that's the cost of the process and the cost of the receipt, et cetera. So if you have an, if everything you're coming in is, everything you're bringing in is unique, you're paying a tremendous amount of money. In fact, we also know that 15% of the transactions that you do are upside down, meaning that the cost of the transaction is greater than the price of the stuff that you bought. It's crazy. Not only that, can you really imagine having to receive from 1,000 trucks a day? It doesn't make a lot of sense. This is one of my favorite things, um, cycle counting. Show of hands, how many people think that cycle counting is value added? So you're not gonna put your hands up because of the way I asked the question, right? So here's the reality, it's not. In fact, if you are cycle counting, it is only because your inventory management system is not capable. If your inventory management system, which includes, which is a heck of a lot more than your MMIS, it's how you work. If that system was capable, you'd never cycle count again. In fact, I should tell you, you should never cycle count again. I also know this from my years in inventory, rather in, in, in industry. When you do your annual physical inventory, you create as many errors as you fix. And you also know this to be true. Whether it's through fat fingering, unit of measure issues. So people will often ask me, so Steve, um, despite having this conversation, and we're looking at their inventory management process, they'll say, so what is the right frequency for counting? Should we be doing it weekly, monthly? Ne never. You should never have to cycle count. Consignment. Somewhere along the line, we thought it was a good idea to move into, to go into consignment agreements with suppliers. And it kind of makes sense, right? I don't have to pay for it till I use it. So think about this. Um, I have teenage daughters. When I go with my, when I go jean shopping with my daughters, uh, it's pretty clear I'm not gonna walk out with the $40 jeans, right? But one of the reasons why we're paying so much for a pair of jeans is that the cost of shoplifting is baked into the price of the jeans. And it's exactly the same thing in consignment. We talked about this earlier. That anywhere from 10 to 30% of the supply chain is waste. And so you got to believe that all of the obsolescence, that the cost of trunk stock, of having folks driving around with hundreds of thousands of dollars in materials in their trunk, that the cost of, of uh, expiration, that isn't the price that you pay. Regardless, I would encourage you while you're here to go to the BJC and Cook Medical uh, presentation. They've been doing this on our platform for a while and they're seeing fantastic results. Tremendous savings moving away from consignment. Guy across the street from me is the uh, National Vice President of Sales for a large um, implantables device manufacturer. Um, drives a much nicer car than I do, right? 
recently had a whole lot of upgrades made to his garage. He's got these beautiful garage doors, and his garage is climate controlled because it is the primary storage location for all of his goods. In fact, if you think about it, the primary storage location for the most expensive, sensitive items that you purchase for, your, for, for patient care is somewhere between the kids' bikes and the lawnmower. Right. Now, another interesting, interesting thing that's happening, we talked about a little bit about the ACA, is the unique device identification law. Are you familiar with this? So this went into effect in September 2013. There are three major, um, er, there are three major areas to it. The first went into effect uh, a year ago, and we have the next couple, which is essentially class three, class two, class one devices. Half the manufacturer, the manufacturer has to have unit level control, track tracing control of every one of those each's. So they have to know where it went, who used it, who has it, all that information. You got to believe, you got to believe that in four and a half years, when that is completed, that providers are going to see new legislation requiring you to do something with that information. Right now, it's manufacturer focused. Now, what's interesting is when that first became law, um, I asked around. I said, that, that's crazy. I can't believe that wasn't a law already. Is it possible that my grandmother has a, a heart valve and no one knows who made it? And folks said, oh, yeah, we don't have a way to do that. And I thought, that's, that can't be right. 20 years ago, I knew exactly what airbag was in what car and who owns it. And if you've ever bought a used car and subsequently received a recall notice, you're thinking, how'd they know that I have the car? And it's simple, because every car has a unique device identification, the VIN. It's exactly the same principle. So let's talk a little bit about replenishment. Um, there are really two primary ways that we typically traditionally replenish. The first is forecasting. Now, I live my life on three basic principles professionally, that batching is bad, variation is evil, and I call forecasting the F word. Right? And so why is forecasting so easy? Because it's never right. And so because it's never right, your requirements are kind of low. Your expectations of it are kind of low. Unless you have access to a clairvoyant. If you've got a clairvoyant on staff, maybe you can forecast. Otherwise, and think about this. Do you remember, remember the Psyche Friends Network? If you're up late at night buying stuff like me online or on TV, right? And they went bankrupt. Like, you, you think they would have saw it coming, right? Anyway, so the other problem with, with this is it's a stocking strategy. It's a stocking strategy. And the reason why this works for retail is because retail, when, they, when, they, when they're done with something, they take all their leftovers and they give it to a secondary market. So if you walk into TJ Maxx or Marshalls, you can buy really expensive stuff off the shelf at a, at a fraction of the price. We can't do that, nor should we be able to do that. One of the issues that we have in North America is the incredibly expensive things that we buy, and that opens us up to have the availability of, of, of counterfeit products. So we at Cardinal Health are very proud of the fact that we have a very, very tight supply chain. I wouldn't want to have a secondary market available of, of goods that used to be in a hospital. The second way is how we think that um, industry like automotive and aerospace work, which is you make a hole, fill a hole, it is um, demand-based. Whatever I used, I replenish. And it works for things like aerospace space and automotive because they've been doing it for 30 years plus. They work to a central portal, which means that when an item is made and used, everyone in the supply chain sees this at once. Sees this at once because they have very defined relationships. The relationships between the manufacturer and the end user are very clearly defined, and the end user doesn't go and buy at, at will at, at, at the lowest price. And so they're tied very, very closely. Right? We don't share information in healthcare like industry does. It would be great if we did. So there's an art to doing this right. Right? And I, I think of it as a three-legged stool. So you've got capital, transportation, and labor. So if you're being pressured to say, you've got to increase your inventory turns, you've got to get them up from three. Right? That's funny. 
Well, maybe it's not funny. So, oof, sorry. <laughs> it's interesting for me, coming from automotive, we were doing 100 inventory turns. I came to Cardinal Health, uh, walked through massive buildings, and I was shocked to find out that most of our customers were doing like four. Folks will ask me all the time, what is the right target for inventory turns? I'll tell you this, if you're doing traditional finance, you got to beat 12. Target 12 and a half, right? As long as you beat 12, that means you're turning your inventory in better than 30 days. It makes everyone's life so much easier. You're getting pressure to reduce your trans. You're going to probably bring more stuff in and drive up capital, right? If you're getting pressure to reduce labor, you're going to probably do the same thing. You got to find a balance between the three. The only way to really be able to understand how to balance them is through technology. So, ARM for years has been saying this. We wholeheartedly agree. For your expensive things that need to be tracked, traced, and controlled, we should be using RFID. RFID is the platform that allows all the way from the manufacturer all the way to the patient to be able to see those goods, those goods and those products. About two years ago, um, we were very fortunate that the company was available and we did an acquisition of a company called Wavemark. Um, at the time, based on what we were hearing through ARM uh, in the previous year, we had actually been looking at doing a major investment in an RFID platform. We were going to spend more innovation dollars on developing an RFID platform. We went, looking, we went out looking at, uh, at world class, what we consider to be world class. What are the best different ways of doing this? And we found Wavemark, we found all the best things in one place. And so we were able to do that acquisition. Uh, Wavemark is now a Cardinal Health company and they are essentially, they are doing exactly what we want them to do. It is a platform that allows you to see all of your eaches. Imagine waking up on a Saturday morning at six o'clock having a cup of coffee, opening your laptop, and saying, where's all the expensive stuff in my network, in my IDN, that's gonna expire in the next 90 days? And getting a listing of everything, the value of it, and exactly where it's at. Crazy. We should use RFID for expensive and sensitive things. We usually target around $50 in value. For stuff under that, and especially commodity items, it doesn't make sense. But since we're using commodity items today using the PAR system, we tend to, a lot of my customers think they're sitting on 17 or 18 DIOH, days of inventory on hand. When my team is in doing work with a customer, we'll often find they're sitting on 70 or 80 days of inventory and don't even know it. Um, a couple of years ago, the master black belts from Cardinal Health and the master black belts from the Joint Commission, Joint Commission, right? got together and spent a couple days. Turns out they're a Lean Six Sigma company. And uh, we were talking about you all, right? Having, it was fun. Um, they actually love you. Uh, hearing hysterical stories related to what happens in traditional PAR system counting. So, you know that Jayco's coming. You know that you've got a, uh, uh, an on-site inspection, an assessment. So, pretty good guess, correct me if I'm wrong, that for the weeks leading up to that, everybody's working crazy over time, going through every single location in the hospital, trying to find stuff that's expired, right? I know it's true, I've watched it happen. And so, we gather all that stuff up, and the first thing that I think of, by the way, when I see that, is shame on us that that stuff is even available to a patient in the first place. Shame on us. But whatever we do with it, we gather it up, we hide it someplace, we get rid of it, um, Monday morning, nurse Dave comes in, he's been on vacation for two weeks. Nurses are often working transient weird hours, right? So Dave doesn't even know that there's a, an accreditation audit. Someone says, oh, Jake goes here, runs to his locker, grabs all the stuff that he's been hiding, goes and puts it where? Back in a bin. And an hour later, and I know it's crazy the how they do this, but an hour later, somebody from Jayco reaches in and pulls out an expired product, and we're shocked that that happens. Part of it is because of the way we, because those, so, so when I'm expecting someone to do put away, I expect that person to do FIFO. What's FIFO stand for? First in, first out. What's the opposite of FIFO? Yeah, I, I think of it as fish. 
first in, still here. Right? <laughs> so my ask is, replace your PAR system. We learned something in the 80s from Toyota that Toyota's been doing since the 50s and they're still doing it exactly the same way in 2015. They're using a thing called a Kanban. K-A-N-B-A-N. If you don't know what it is, then please, after this, go and talk to the folks at the Cardinal booth. They're going to show you what a Kanban is. People over the last couple of years have tried to make really sexy, expensive versions of Kanbans. The fact is, the Kanban in its original form is the best way of doing this. It creates perfect FIFO. You know exactly what your demand pattern is, and it requires very, very little labor to do it correctly, and you never count again, ever. Trick is, you gotta have a system. And so the risk that you've got is you're either gonna overinvest in inexpensive things or underinvest in expensive things. Because you're trying to find a one size fits all solution. There is no such thing as a one size fits all solution. However, there is a one platform sits all, suits all that allows you to do all of the different levels of inventory management on the same platform. Imagine on an iPad being able to see exactly the status of everything that you buy in your hospital, where it's at, where it's flowing, what the demand pattern is, whether it's an expensive item that needs to be individually tracked, traced, or controlled, or it's a commodity item that sits in. So here's the other crazy thing. A 250-bed hospital will have anywhere from 10 to 20,000 individual stocking locations. You'll have the same item that sits in multiple places, but every one of those places has its own little personality. Sometimes it's really flat, sometimes it's really crazy. You can't tell, anecdotally, how you're doing. You've got to have a way to be able to measure that demand variation. We call it Cardinal Health Inventory Management Solutions, SIMS but we prefer you call it Cardinal Health Inventory Management Solutions. But what SIMS allows us to do is to be able to see all of those items from the very expensive to the, to the inexpensive in one, single, in one simple place. This is my contact information. Um, I certainly would love hearing from anyone who's interested in seeing or hearing more about this. I hope you enjoyed uh, my conversation and I, I would love to welcome any questions that you might have. Yes. So this is a software then that would manage all of the supply chain, including drugs? So the question she's asking is, this is a supply chain, this is a software that will manage all the supply chain, including trucks. This is an inventory management end user level. Um, I don't like to think of it as a software. This is a process, right? This is a process, a way of doing things, which is supported by a, by a software. Um, we don't... The SIMS that we're talking about today doesn't manage the entire end-to-end -end supply chain. If you're interested in that, we do use SIMS as a vehicle to measure the, to do the entire thing, from the manufacturer all the way through transportation, through warehousing and distribution, all the way into your hospital and ultimately to a patient. Absolutely exists, just like that today. Great question. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the time at ARM. <laughs>